Yeah. Our own, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's about the sparsifying um, something. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so, sparsification. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for the brief introduction. Um, so, okay. So today I'm going to be talking about this, the problem of sparsification. Uh, the general structure is the first part of the talk would probably just be kind of a light introduction. Just the types of problems I'm going to consider, and then maybe some stuff I've done. And in the second part of the talk, I'll try to get into a proof of one of these sparsification algorithms, not for anything I worked on, but like for stuff that was known 30 years ago. But I still feel like it's a nice thing. That one might be good to explain, given that we have two hours. So let me start with the problem. So in the problem, the general structure is that we have a function. Um, so we have a function, capital F of X, which is the sum of functions F I of X. And it's here it's good to think of F I as being functions on R n to r at least zero and think of m as being much larger than n not like exponent like think m is like n cubed or something that i don't know okay and the goal is to try to find weights w1 w2 to wm at least zero and hopefully, actually, most of these w's are going to be equal to zero. Um, and what you want is that if you define f tilde of x, sum so i is 1 to m, w i f i x, then f of x minus f tilde x, and most epsilon times f x for all x. So it's like a one plus epsilon multiplicative approximation everywhere on Rn. This is like, um, that's a goal you might want for sparsification. And in general, we think that we've solved the problem well when we can show the existence of weights Wi such that the number of non-zero Wi's is at most up to constants n over epsilon squared times uh, so that's the general problem setup. Um, does that make sense? Any questions with the setup? Okay. Uh, Can you explain why that's the right number? Oh, why this is the right number? Um, good. Okay. So maybe let me just write down a couple natural examples and then we'll, we'll, we'll see. Uh, yeah. Let me write. Yeah. How important is the non-negativity assumption? On the um, I mean, it's a little weird if it's if the function be positive and negative because then this kind of notion, like multiplicative approximation, doesn't really make sense. Ah, okay. With uh, functions that can be both positive and negative, and I have some. It's like the sum might be zero somewhere, and then you ask for a multiplicative approximation, ah, and it's kind of nonsense. I see. I see. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> What's up? What about an additive approximation? Additive, um, good. Then you probably need some kind of more assumptions on the functions f for additive to make sense. In general, for a lot of this talk, I'm going to be thinking about functions f that are homogeneous. Like homogeneous as in like if I scale x by a factor of two, then f of x will scale by some, you know, some like two to the k factor where k is like a constant. So in that sense, then this multiple approximation makes a lot of sense. Um, when you don't have homogeneous functions or other things, then you have to be a little more careful with how you, uh, like, uh, with how you define this, this kind of thing properly. Okay. So let me just start with a couple natural examples. Um, one of the most natural settings for this problem that's been studied for a long time is when the functions f i of x are in fact, uh, I'm just going to abuse notation and say that they're in fact functions in one dimension. And fi here is from r now to r at least zero. So like, in fact, instead of thinking now as f as a function on rn, 
Think of, I in fact have just functions on R and each FI is a function of the inner product of AI with X for some vector AI and RN. So this is a very natural setting. For example, FI of X is AI dot X squared, where AI is some vector in RN. So just to write it out again, here then you would have FX would be the sum of AI dot X squared. And now you can ask, well, if I want to sparsify this down to uh, like to that, then why is this kind of number the right thing? Um, so where does the N come from? The N comes from the fact that imagine each of these AIs are kind of like in N different directions, then I can't afford to lose any direction. So the N is necessary. And where does the epsilon squared come in? It's kind of like from a turnoff bound type thing. So in fact, for this specific problem, it's known that the time bound is N over epsilon squared without any log factors. So that's kind of like the, that's the best you can possibly hope for. For, for a lot of algorithmic applications, you kind of don't care about whether you have log factors. And in fact, this is basically the only setting where I know that anyone knows how to show that you can remove all the log factors. So, yeah. So yeah, this is a natural setting. And you can also imagine replacing this two with the power P. And uh, I'll kind of talk about for each of those settings, what the best known bounds are and everything. Okay. Um, so why might anyone care about this? So you can also put like uh, up to the absolute value, right? Uh, like you, you, oh, just, when I say to the p power, what I mean is absolute value to the p power. That's no, but you can also put just absolute value to, to the one. Yeah, to the one. Yeah. Talk about that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's that's part of it. Yeah, absolute value to the one. Yeah. So yeah, why might people care? Uh, so in fact, this specific version I'm talking about, like when you've absolute value to the p power, this was studied by a lot of the functional analysts back in like the '90s for reasons. Uh, the more the algorithmic reason you might care is kind of let's imagine I wanted to solve the problem of like least squares regression, which is just min over x sum a i dot x minus b i squared sum i is one m uh, so x. Right. Uh, say I wanted to solve least squares regression, I wanted to minimize this, then. What I can maybe let's say I can let's say I run some sparsification procedure, and then I instead will solve min x in R n sum W i a i dot x minus b i squared, right? If the W i's were a good sparsifier weight for for a good sparsifier weight, then these problems are a constant factor approximation of each other, and thus I've uh, at least produce a constant factor approximation to the squares regression. Uh, you know, sorry, and what, what should I say? Uh, on, on this side, notice that most of the WIs are all zero. So this problem is actually like much sparser in some sense. Like this problem had like N times M different inputs I had to care about, like input, like coordinates. This only has about N squared because I've sparsified down to about the size N. Uh, so if you want efficient algorithms, you can take this, sparsify it, work on this instead, and, you're, and the algorithms are faster. Um, in fact, what I should say is that uh, naively, this only gives you like a factor two approximation, but it's known that you can, in, at least in this setting, that you can take any sparsifier here that gives just a factor two approximation and then apply some like optimization method on the outside and boost it to get a high accuracy approximation, which is like epsilon error, and the runtime is like log one over epsilon multi, like as an extra multiplicative. So even though it, like, it naively only gives you a factor two approximation, you can often boost it with optimization frameworks. Why, why do you insist on using the original functions weighted? Why not choose other functions? Uh, yeah, why do I insist on using the original functions weighted? Um, good, that's a good question. Uh, for that, let me go on to the next part just for a little bit, okay. It, uh, so on why you insist on using the original functions, um, I guess, so if you don't insist on using the original functions for L2, you can kind of trivially get size N just by like, so this is gonna be some matrix, some quadratic form. You can decompose it into its eigenvectors and then, you know, that's size N, right? So why might this kind of be not very useful? Um, 
So for that, let's talk about graphs. So in a graph, you can define, uh, maybe let's start with a spectral form since I've been talking about that. Um, on a graph, the Laplacian is basically defined as the matrix whose spectral form is given by uh, X transpose LX equals sum over edges UV of, let's call it RUV, this is some positive weight, XU minus XV squared. Um, yeah, okay, so that's, that's the graph Laplacian, right? And in a lot of efficient graph algorithms, um, what the algorithms often do is somehow like a dense graph comes up in the course of the algorithm. And then you sparsify the graph, you know, up to a factor of two approximation, and then you apply some optimization method on the outside to improve it. So in this case, it makes a lot of sense to request that I output, um, that it makes a lot of sense for me to force that the sparsifier has the same structure as the original problem. If I just, you know, take an eigen decomposition, then I lose all my graph structure immediately, and it becomes much denser. Like here, all the vectors are just edges, and I get to maintain that even when I uh, build a sparsifier. So that's for the L2 case. For all the other situations like not L2, I actually don't know how to do any better if I just allow you to choose, you know, do whatever you want. Um, like yeah, for the LP cases. So that's the short answer for graphs. Okay. Uh, also, it might be useful just to transition to talk, to talk about Keith Powers, talk about cuts a little bit. Uh, so the graph cut would be the cut corresponding to a set S to V minus S would be the sum of UV in E, the weight of UV. I'm going to write it as XU minus XV. And here X is the indicator vector of the set uh, S. So as you can see, the graph cuts also have the same form. Uh, so like a cut sparse bar where you like find a graph that um, has all the same cuts up to a constant is exactly that. And notice that this just generalizes that to me. Okay, uh, let me just state a bit on some known, known bounds. Okay. Uh, known bounds. Basically, it seems that for the most part, sparsification has been studied at least uh, a while back when these functions are powers of P. So let me just kind of write out what's known. Um, okay. So if the function is AI dot X squared, um, you can get N over epsilon squared, no logarithmic factors. This is a... Uh, Batson, Spielman, Sudastava. This is, to be honest, quite surprising in some sense. Now, once so you're saying if it's AI dot X to the P, um, if P is, I guess if P is, uh, let me just write P between one and two. You can get n over epsilon squared and then times some factors. Uh, this is total wrong. Okay. Um, P equals one, I guess you can remove, you can like remove some of the log logs where it, these things don't matter so much. It's just for completeness. Uh, you can, in, in fact, you can ask P less than one and you can still do O tilde n over epsilon squared. Um, now, finally, P greater than two, something a little bit possibly surprising happens. The correct bound is actually N to the P over two over epsilon squared. Um, this is for gain the Dick Strauss statement. Okay, but it's actually N to the P over two over epsilon squared. So kind of P equals two is a cutoff for what the truth is. And for this, you can kind of show that a uh, random set of vectors AI will, will kind of achieve this bound. You can't do better. Okay. okay. Uh, good. 
random set of this size, you cannot sparsify it. That's right. Yeah. Kind of what happens is, uh, okay, let me see if I can give a good reason why that happens. Basically, the reason that happens is if I have a set of that many vectors, uh, okay, in fact, let me just kind of write out the reason that you get the end of the P over two. <laughs> Imagine I have like A1, call it AK, and these are like random. Remember what I wanted. I wanted to under I wanted to sparsify this sum, sum ai dot x to the p, right? Now imagine I now imagine like I try to test x equals ai. Then what will what will happen? What will happen is that well, uh, random and I should say L two norms are one. Then what's going to happen if I try this? Well, the ai dot x term will be one. Right, and the remaining a j dot x terms will be about one over root n. So, um, well, these terms won't contribute if I only pick that many. They'll only contribute like a constant fraction of the mass. So I can't really afford to delete the a i term. Is kind of the idea. Uh, so, in particular, the sum of j not equal to i of a i dot x to the p going to be the most n to the minus p over two times. So if k is n most this quantity, then the other terms are not really going to contribute more than a constant. So I can't really afford to delete any terms. So that's kind of why that's the right answer. Okay, yeah. So I guess um, after I do some of the intro stuff, my goal is going to be to look at the L2 case, the AI dot X squared case, and just try to show a bound of O tilde um, N over epsilon squared. In fact, the proof of N over epsilon squared is very different. Uh, it's like, it, it's just, it's a very different style of proof. Uh, but I'll, for learning purposes, I'll try to show that O tilde N over epsilon squared version. Okay. Now, next. So what is my personal interest in some of this kind of thing? Uh, if you recall over here, I said that if you start with, uh, if you want to solve least squares regression, say to some high accuracy, then it suffices to compute a factor two quality sparsifier for um, least squares regression, basically. So what if you wanted to, instead of solving least squares regression, you wanted to solve like LP norm regression, say P less than two, um, P between one and two, let's say. So this is the min over X in Rn, sum over I is one to M, AI dot X minus BI to the power P. Let's say your goal was to try to solve this problem to high accuracy. Um, then what type of sparsifier would I have to produce in order to be able to get this to high accuracy instead of low accuracy? That's one natural question. Um, so a natural thing to guess is maybe, you know, I just compute these Ws and I just compute the sparsifier of this and then I just kind of say the same boosting thing here works. That's actually not really true. You have to be much more careful than that. Um, it turns out that the thing you have to sparsify to get high accuracy is you have to sparsify something like the Bregman divergence of the LP norm function. Um, and the Bregman divergence of, you know, x squared is x squared, basically. So that's why this works. Here, the functions are a little weirder. Um, basically, what you can check is that the Bregman divergence, what it, okay, I should write what the Bregman divergence is. The Bregman divergence of a function around a point is like, if you delete the first order Taylor expansion of the function, whatever's left, that's the definition of the Bregman divergence. Um, so this would be what? Like basically it would be X plus one to the P minus P times X to the P minus one. This is the, and then minus uh, this is the one minus um, P times X to P minus one. Like, for example, that's the Bregman divergence of the x to the p function, because this is like the 
first order Taylor expansion around um, one. Okay. And you can check that this is actually approximately min of x squared and x to the p, basically what it is, up to constants. So the, the thing that I wanted to actually specify was sums of things that look like this, where x is actually ai dot x. And what you can show is that if you can specify this type of more complicated thing, then you can get high accuracy algorithms for uh, LP normal regression. So this was like kind of uh, a kind of roundabout way of explaining what my interest in this is. Um, and that is one thing that we do show, like uh, maybe I should say like result with uh, Arun, Jumble, Apache, James Lee, Aaron Sufer. Uh, so we show for functions like this, we call this gamma p of x. We, can, we show that for sum of gamma p ai dot x, p less than two, you can sparsify to uh, o tilde n over epsilon squared uh, sparsity. So yeah. Um, and as a result, you get some kind of fast LP normal regression. So that's like a first result. Um, I'm really not going to talk too much about this. It, I just wanted to kind of explain where I'm coming from. Okay. Uh, are there any questions before I move on to stuff? Yeah. Like what, what's the runtime of uh, finding these? Uh, for this one, runtime of finding it, it's like solving like, like, a, like O tilde one lever score calculations. So like you, you couldn't get a high accuracy algorithm for LP regression, yeah, other methods? Oh, uh, not in that runtime, no. I see. Okay. Yeah. Um, like previous runtimes, like it depended a lot on like M, if that makes sense. Like M versus N is kind of the, like if you had a very tall LP regression, since like M, like uh, with M entries, then it, you, yeah, it wasn't really known how to reduce that to like an N by N instance and uh, yeah. So like the goal of this is you reduce to an n by n instance and then you just solve that and you repeat a couple of times. Um, okay. So let's see what I'm doing. Uh, so what I could do now, let me just finish up talking a little bit about a couple more problems you might want to sparsify and where you can go from them, and then I'll try to get into actually. Saying, everything eventually is some, some function of the inner product, or can you look at other things? Yeah, right now I'm going to try to talk about things that are not just sums of inner products. Uh, you can look at other things. Yeah. Some of the inner products are just a particularly uh, nice case that comes up a lot in like optimization. What about that? Good? Uh, first complete like projections on higher dimensional things. Uh, I think I'm going to basically get into that. Okay. okay. Um, good. So to try to introduce talking about higher dimensional things, let me talk about uh, hypergraphs, which is talk about hypergraphs. Okay. Let's look at the hypergraph cut function to start. So uh, maybe okay. Maybe let me start by defining a hypergraph. A hypergraph is formally a collection of subsets S1 to SM of N. And given this hypergraph, let's call it H, the cut in H of a set S is the number of SI that S non-trivially intersects. What I mean by this is that uh, S non trivially intersects SI if S is not contained in any of the SI and like the SI are not contained in S or something like that. Like they need to have a non trivial intersection. Uh, let me just write out the formula so it's a little nicer. Um, the way I want to write it in a way that you can think of it as a sparsification problem. So it's going to be sum I equals one to M of, uh, let me write it as max U V in. SI of x u minus x v, where here once again x is the indicator of the set S. So like notice that this is not an inner, this is like not the sum of inner products anymore. Now I have the sum 
of the max of a bunch of inner products. Uh, so this is like starting to go towards higher dimensional things. Um, and you can also define spectral in a similar way. These are all things that one to M of max UV in SI XU dot XV squared. XU dot, uh, XU minus XU? Uh, it should be minus, yeah, minus. Okay. Yeah, minus. I, I, I think I wrote, did I say dot? Sure. <laughs> yeah, I think I hit <laughs> XU minus XV squared. Yeah. Okay. So as you can see, these are like higher dimensional things that you can, that you can define, um, somehow in hypergraphs, it's very natural to just, somehow this naturally comes up. I get the max of a bunch of inner product forms. Yeah, was that a question? Or something? Okay. So for this stuff, um, you can show some results here and maybe let me just, okay, let me just write it here. Um, for cuts, it's known how to do, and log n over epsilon squared. Uh, for spectral, a lot more effort. Um, initially, it was n cubed, I think. Soma, Yoshida, and then uh, n r cubed over epsilon squared. Here, r is the maximum size of any of the SIs. Uh, this is Faisal, Spencer, Trevisan, and then. Okay, we can do something like nr and then like n over epsilon squared with logs. Um, and then some more stuff, epsilon to the fourth. Okay, anyways, the upshot is that eventually you can get n log n log r over epsilon squared. So like a little worse. And this, this is the stuff that's known for hypergraphs basically. So like, even for these more complicated things, you can still get size n over epsilon squared up to logarithmic factors. So, like, notice that this completely generalizes all the ground specification stuff I just talked about because I could just let the set SI be like size one or size two, like this. Uh, good. So, let's go one step further to like sparsifying even higher dimensional things and see where you go. So I think the problem that we thought generalized kind of all of this stuff that I just talked about is sparsifying sums of norms. Um, to me, this is interesting mostly because it, it actually will generalize everything that I've talked about. So uh, yeah. here's sparsifying sums of norms means I have a norm nx to the power p, which is the sum i is one to n, n i x to the p, where here n i are norms, or let me write semi norms on r n. So formally, we say that n is a norm or a semi norm if it satisfies the scaling. n of lambda x is lambda n x, and it is convex. So most n x plus n. Then we call this a semi norm. It's a norm of like nothing is zero other than zero, but that's not too important. Um, and you can have this sum and you can ask, can I sparsify this? So notice that this once again generalizes this up here uh, because you can check that the max of any linear is well, that's a kind of exactly the definition of a norm from a dual sense. Like a norm is just the maximum of its supporting hyperplanes. So each of these are norms. So if you could solve this problem, then you can. Uh, Generalize all of this. Okay. Uh, I guess to write it out even more explicitly, I can imagine I have the sum of a i x infinity norm square. But here, a i is just a matrix, and the matrix consists of rows b x u minus x v, where you know u v are in s i. So this would be exactly that, and this is evidently a norm squared. Yeah. In this example, you can say a little more that these are norms on, the, on R to the D for some small D. Correct, yeah. You first have a linear projection, and then you can do That's right, yeah, yeah. yeah. So in, in this example, it's even better. It's because I, I can project down to like a size R space, which is where R is the size of the uh, hyper edge. But in general, you can just ask, like, what if they're just arbitrary norms? Can I say anything? Um, 
So for this, once again, uh, with some joint work with Arun, James, and Aaron, we show that if the norm N is P uniformly smooth, I'm not gonna really, I'm not really gonna define that this is some property of a, that a norm can satisfy, then you can achieve psi O tilde and over epsilon squared. I should also say P less than P and those two. P is always the most true. As I said, if P is greater than two, then it's not possible. Um, if P uniformly smooth, then you can get size two. Uh, and if P is one, then I guess kind of by the definition, all norms are P uniformly smooth. So for P equals one, like if I just have the sum of norms, then uh, it will always be sparsifiable. And you can check that for these infinity norms of R things, they're log R uniformly smooth. So that ends up being fine too. Like, sorry, like the smoothness constant is log R for P equals two, I should say. Yeah, for P, so like P equals one, if I have the sum of norms, just the sum without squares, uh, then you can get sine O tilde N over epsilon squared. Okay, so I think that's most of the intro I wanted to get through before getting to any proofs. So does, does anyone have any questions about like any of this uh, intro content before I start working on how to kind of switch gears and start talking about uh, sparsifying self squares? So yeah, in the remainder of the talk, what I want to do is I want to present a kind of full proof from first principles of how you would argue as sparsifying sum of ai dot x squared. So just once again, uh, sum i is one to m ai dot x squared. And kind of the goal will just be to Try to walk everyone through how you would come up with an algorithm to sparsify this type of function. And the proof basically will be elementary. There's going to be nothing. Well, like elementary as, but like it starts some elementary principles, but you eventually build some stuff, which I guess I don't know. I don't know. To start, I guess. I want to maybe just introduce a framework for sparsification that's flexible and simple. The framework is some kind of random sampling procedure. In the sparsification by sampling procedure, the goal basically is to, well, I want to choose these weights wi, where most of them are zero, and a lot of them, well, yeah, most of them are zero. So the general plan is to pick probabilities p1 to pm, okay? These are probabilities all in zero, one. Uh, they don't sum to one, like there is going to be an independent, like Bernoulli per coordinate. And I'm going to set wi, equals one over P1, PI, with probability PI, and zero otherwise. Okay. This way, the expectation of WI is one. So if you produce a sample like this, it's going to be unbiased. And then the remainder of the, the remainder of the proof will basically consist of two parts. Part one will be, how do I actually choose these PIs? And then how do I show that in fact, this procedure works for all X and RN, which is maybe the more interesting part. Um, so let me start by discussing how to actually choose these probabilities.
this is like part one of the proof of uh, choosing PIs. The way that you want to choose the PIs intuitively to start is that you want kind of PI to represent how important coordinate I is to the total sum in some sense, okay? And also maybe more, con more concretely, mathematically, you want to choose PI so that for a single fixed X, I can argue that that one will be a one plus epsilon approximation in the sparse fire with high probability. But those are like my two goals. So let's just think about, I, I just give you a fixed X and I want that one to be correct. Then you know, uh, how should I choose the PI so that for every X that ends up being true. For this, let's write out the, um, for this, for this specific case, uh, to move towards that, let me do a couple of simple reductions so we can more easily reason about how we might want to choose the PIs. So I guess uh, reduction, I'm going to assume that the total spectral form kind of is the identity, whatever that means. Uh, let me just write this out. So notice that sum x dot ai squared is x transpose sum i one to m ai ai transpose times x. Let me call this matrix m. I want to show that, well, basically I'm going to say that you can consider the, when M equals the identity matrix, which assume that M equals the identity. Um, so the form I'm considering is like, in fact, just X dot AI squared is X squared. Uh, why can I assume that M is the identity matrix? Basically, it's that, uh, basically the reason is I can just perform a linear transformation in space. Uh, like I, I need to show sparsification for all X anyways at the end of the day. So I can apply any linear transformation and that doesn't affect my statement. I apply linear transformation by M to the minus a half on X and then uh, the result will be the identity. A little more concretely, notice that sum M to the minus Imagine instead of sparsifying this, I sparsify this instead. This is completely equivalent because I request sparsification for all x. This is sum x dot m to the minus a half ai squared, which by definition equals just x to long squared. So basically just imagine replacing the vectors ai by those vectors instead. Then they're not unit vectors. Uh -huh. And then they're, they're not unit vectors. Uh, in, the, in the original form, they're not unit vectors either. Oh, they weren't? They weren't, no. It doesn't matter. Yeah. It actually doesn't matter. They're not unit. Yeah. yeah. So instead, I just, I just replaced them with that. Yeah, 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 this one's like very general. Like you can you can kind of there's very very few original initial assumptions you need. Like the initial assumptions are just AI just vectors in RN. You don't need anything else. Um, okay. So now now that we're in the setting where the form is the identity, uh, let me do a couple calculations now to help motivate how you would pick the PIs. The main calculation to understand would be well, I produced. F tilde X, which is an unbiased, oh, let me just write this up. So F tilde X is sum WI, where WI once again is this Bernoulli, uh, F of AI dot X squared. And I know that the expectation of F tilde X is FX, right? So th the thing I probably want to understand is, uh, well, so I don't want to under I want to bound this type of quantity. I want to bound this. I want to, uh, to, bound to bound. So it's probably useful to understand the variance of F tilde. And a calculation, because WI are Bernoulli's, will basically show that the variance is at most sum. A i dot x 
to the fourth power, uh, because it's squared and it's squared again, fourth power, divided by the sampling probability pi. So that's what the variance is going to be. So let me write down one more inequality, going to be at most max over i in M a i dot x squared divided by p i times sum i is one to m a i dot x squared, which exactly equals x to norm squared. That's the second term. Max i in m a i so remember what f of x was uh, so recall that f of x was exactly x to norm squared right so you kind of want to so like f of x is that so you want the variance to be at most epsilon i uh, so you kind of want intuitively that the variance of f tilde the most something like x to the two norm to the fourth times epsilon squared. And then you'll have an epsilon error on average. Uh, so now what I want to do is pick pi so that this quantity for all x is kind of bounded the way I expect. Uh, maybe. Does anyone have any questions? Or maybe I can also give everyone a second to think about what a natural choice of PI would be then to help guarantee that I can bound this term well for all values of X. Does anyone have any ideas on how you might pick the PIs to? The norm square divided by the inner product to AI for, for fixed X. Um, PI should be independent of X, but you're hoping that somehow that this term is bounded well for all X. Question on the norm of AI squared? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's basically right. So PI should be proportional let me write it as rho for now times the norm of AI squared. Um, so why does this work? Well, then this second term, max AI dot X squared over PI by Cauchy Schwartz will be at most one over rho times X to norm squared, right? So this whole quantity, the variance, is at most one over rho x2 norm to the fourth. So for example, if I had chosen rho to be epsilon to the minus two, then this would be at most epsilon squared x2 norm to the fourth. So the variance is at most that, and therefore on average kind of the error will be also at most that for a fixed x. Okay, good. So that's part one of the calculation. So. We're going to pick, we're going to like keep this choice for later. This P is, PI is always going to be rho times AI two norm squared. Uh, later, we might have to ramp up rho by logarithmic factors to get concentration everywhere, but it's always going to be this form, basically. It's going to be rho times that, and rho is going to be epsilon to the minus two times logarithmic factors. So what if the AI, the norms are big, bigger than one? Um, good. Uh, if the norms are bigger than one. Okay, let me do that in two parts. Um, the first part is, well, I, I, I guess there's two parts. The first part is I sampling by this. So I need to understand actually, what is the sparsity of sampling by PIs? So what is the sparsity? Like how many WIs are non-zero? The sparsity is going to be the sum of the PIs. Right? That's the first part. So this is sum is rho times the sum of AI squared which is rho times the trace of the sum of AI, AI transpose. And because of our isotropic assumptions. Because it's identity. 
Yeah, because of our isotropic assumption, this is rho times n. Okay. So like that's where the n comes from. That's the trace of that. So the sum of these sampling properties is n. That means I got n terms and uh, rho is about one over epsilon squared. So that's like where the n over epsilon squared comes from, basically. Okay. Uh, the other question which I kind of left out is, uh, it still is possible for like, like because I'm not, because rho is bigger than one, it's possible that this probability is bigger than one. In that case, what you do is instead of sampling with, oh, probably bigger than one, you just sample that with probability one. So then it doesn't change and that coordinate doesn't contribute any variance. So like this type of equation still ends up being true. It just like you replace one of the coordinates with zero because I'm sampling it with probability one. So I'm, I'm probably just going to say a little bit more, and then I think it might be a good time to take a short break before I get into the next part. Um, okay. So the, the uh, point of the argument to this point has been that we picked these PIs, and we're able to argue that for any fixed X that we have an epsilon error on average. Um, and now the next goal would be somehow to argue that for all X in RN, which there's kind of exponentially many points, that we're actually getting the correct value on all of them. Uh, actually, maybe before I move on, let me just make a brief note. Uh, I guess you could ask, is there a way to define these probabilities kind of in terms of the original vectors without doing the linear transformation kind of implicitly? And the answer is yes. Uh, you just in instead let PI be defined as rho times uh, AI transpose sum AI, AI transpose inverse, and then AI, and then it's the same. Like, if you undo the linear transformation, that's what it is. The geometric way to see it, some like if I just give you the points on the sphere, can you tell like which one are more important? Like if they cluster together somewhere? <laughs> is there a way to tell? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It's sensitive to small perturbation. No, it's not. I mean, I mean, it's not because like this this equation is just completely not sensitive to small perturbations at all, right? Yeah. It's like small perturbations are not really going to affect this thing too much, in some sense. If they're close to the hyperplane, they're close to being dependent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That could be a problem, right? That's right. Um, let me see. Yeah, I'm not sure I have a good response. Uh, maybe another, another way to think of the sampling probability is like in my sum, sum of ai dot x squared, pi is kind of the maximum proportion, like the maximum fraction of the total value that the ith coordinate can contribute to the sum. So it's sometimes like you kind of need to at least do this much work on it, if that makes sense. If, if the determinant of the sum AI transport is very close to zero. Yeah. Then uh, it could be, a, I mean, did it do, is this cause any issues or it's they're almost like. I mean, somehow everything I'm doing here is like invariant in the linear transformation. So it's like somehow. Linear transformation can be really. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I, Yes, so no, I guess in analysis, it doesn't come in. Yeah. No, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't really come anywhere in some sense because you can kind of move everything to isotropic immediately. And yeah. Okay. Um, good. Very quick question. Would yeah. You, you said at some point, like, there are exponentially many points in RN. What did you mean by that? Oh, oh, um, like, like, uh, Okay, sure. I guess there's infinitely many, but like, okay, it's just, so it like sounds a little ridiculous. Um, what I mean is like, uh, in, okay, so to argue sparsification, it suffices to argue that for all x two norm equals one, let's say, that the error f tilde x minus f x is the most epsilon, right? Like, like that's true. And then you like discretize this set, and then you like discretize. So it's not about like exponentially many points is all to all to c to the n points. So like 
even though like it looks like the infinitely many like really you just care about like the unit ball and then you kind of just discretize it to like whatever area you want like one over poly n and then there's exponentially many okay yeah yeah so in fact that's a good point imagine you like naively work through this analysis then what is the sparsity bound you actually get turns out if you work through this you'll get something like n squared over epsilon squared up to logs um the reason is because if I pick rho to be n over epsilon squared, basically, up to logs, then for any single point, it's going to be sparse right correctly with exponentially good probability. And then I can union bound over all these c to the n points. Uh, like I'm, I'm, I'm adding an extra factor of n on top of the variance. So now for all, so each x now has this. with probability like x of minus n and uh, thus you just write down. So like somehow like this is like the baseline, this n squared over epsilon squared for this type of approach. But somehow it, it, you actually don't need to pay more than logarithmic factors. Okay, and that's going to be kind of what I'm gonna discuss. Uh, maybe, because the next part is going to start getting a little more technical, let's take a short break and then I'll find this out. Large with some variance delta is and most some quantity. The way that I'm going to basically set it up is the following. I'm going to construct a set a delta, which is a subset of B. And I'm going to try to argue that for all X, that there exists a point Z in A delta, such that basically the variance of F tilde X minus F tilde Z is at most delta. And I'm going to have some size bound on a delta. This is going to be the goal, basically. Uh, we'll see later why this is kind of the correct quantity. Um, once again, I'm going. The, what the, the way to formalize like the number of points of variance delta is not too large, is to find a subset a delta of B such that for all points x, uh, I should write x in B to be formal. That there exists a z in this set I found. And the variance of this difference is at most delta. And I have some bound on the side. I like that for, for every x, there is a set. That's right. Yeah. In this set where the, the difference, where the variance of the difference is not large. Move all the way back over here. So anything with large uh, variance would be in that set somehow. Yeah, yeah, like points that are close to like, basically there's two ways to think of the set A delta. One is to think of it as points. Another way is to think of it as a partition of, um, a partition of the unit ball B. In the partition language, it's kind of saying each partition is like the stuff close to a point that has large variance basically. And like partitions and points kind of are the same in because I'm just, it's like a metric notion. I'm caring about like, I'll formalize some of this concept. Okay, so uh, I'm going to change rotation just a little bit now. Um, let's, let's do it the following way. So remember this expression I wrote here. This was the variance of F tilde X minus, this was the variance of F tilde X. Uh, let me write one more expression. Claim. 
since over there I was looking at things like this, the variance of f tilde x minus f tilde z, um, it's useful for me to write out what this is bounded by. Basically, it's going to be bounded by max i in m of a i dot x minus z squared divided by p i. Okay. So that's going to be that. And I'm going to, for notation purposes, define this as d x z squared. So here I'm defining as dxz squared to try to induce the idea that here d is a metric. So you can check that here d is a metric, basically. Um, so d is a metric on Rn, and it's defined to be basically just the square root of the variance. Okay. What is the goal of this? Uh, I guess let me just write down one more claim, which once again is not. This is a little bit of a lie, but let's not worry too much about that. The probability that fx minus fz is, um, I guess, minus f tilde x minus f tilde z is, is greater than, let's write delta times dxz is the most e to the minus one over delta squared. This is like a basically a chart off bound or like a, like a variance tail bound. Uh, okay. I think we might want the delta in the numerator or something. Uh, let me, okay, let me just, uh, let me do it this way then. One over delta, that's better. But okay, then, then, then this looks ridiculous. Let me just write it as like t. e to the minus t squared. And this looks good. That's better. Okay. Yeah. And okay. Yeah, this is better. So this is saying that the probability that this difference uh, differs from my expected value is greater. Uh, the probability that it differs by more than this distance, which is the variance, is the most exponential in minus t squared. This is basically a turnoff bound. So let me just put these up. Now that we have this, now we're basically in position to try to set up how you do a union bound over multiple levels, which is going to be the next goal. So now let me define sets A0, A1, up to AT, all to infinity. And the size of AT is going to be 2 to the 2 to the T. Uh, we'll see where that number comes in. And once again, AT is a subset of the unit ball. These are basically going to correspond to the sets A delta, but I'm but here I'm going to parameterize them by size instead of by the error immediately. Okay. So now we're going to try to bound basically the maximum error. So the plan is going to be, let's start with the point x, right? Let's take the point in A0 that's closest to x. Let's call it x0. Take the point in A1 that's closest to x, call it x1, x2, xt, all the way, right? We want to understand what happens to f of x, but to do the union bound, we want to kind of discretize x to the right points. So let's write it the following way. It's going to be f of x0 plus f of x1 minus f of x0 plus f of xt plus one plus right, minus f of xt plus all the way. Uh, and this is okay because at gets denser and denser. So eventually xt will converge to x. So this is like a valid expansion. Okay. So now that we've given a way to write f of x as the sum of a bunch of stuff, and we want to bound the error on x, so observe that for every term I've written down here, the number of different possibilities for xt plus one and xt is finite in terms of t, right? Like the number of pairs xt plus one xt is at most 
size of a t plus one, size of a t, which is at most two to the o of two to the t. So the plan will be to bound the error on f of x. I'm going to just bound the maximum error of each of these terms separately and then add everything up. And that's going to be the bound. Does the plan make sense? Now let me define the event ET. Well, it's going to be the event that for all XT plus one in AT plus one and XT in AT that the error on this difference is at most the variance basically there. The error of this guy of the difference against the f tildes is the most two to the t over two, basically. Uh, sorry. Um, yeah, that's right. Times d of x t plus one. Xt. Okay. Okay. Then, basically, by what I've written earlier, the probability of et. Uh, basically, by those claims up there, the probability of et is at least. One minus the size of a t, size of a t plus one times x. Uh, I should put a constant factor here. X of two to the two to the t to constants again. Right? And rem re recall that the size of these sets was like at most two to the o of two to the t. So these cancel and you get the probability of this is at least two to the minus two to the t basically. So then you get that all the EI hold, all the EI hold by a union bound. And to finish up kind of the error analysis of the sampling, just like, just to finish, to finish up the error analysis of the sampling, just in terms of these sets AT, without defining any, without like defining the sets AT, um, you can see that the total error now is at most the sum of these terms. Sum two to the T over two, the distance between X T plus one, xt. And to move everything back to x, you use the triangle inequality one more time, dx xt and dx xt plus 1. Okay. And then we get uh, basically n minus up to constants, 2 to the t over 2, the distance from x to xt, right, which is by definition Two to the t over two distance from s. So, so like that expression is just given general sets a one to a t. What is the error of my sampling procedure? It's it's this quantity there. Okay, uh, this is basically what people call uh, Dudley's inequality. Uh, Maybe it's good to just stop for a second and see if this proof made any sense. Um, so once again, the high level goal was to 
Say I have generic sets A0, A1, which are subsets of B, and I attempt to use these sets to bound the error by sampling procedure. And if you just kind of decompose X as the sum of like, you kind of just hop between the different sets, and then you use the union bound, then you get that the total error accumulated on X is bounded by sum two to the two over two, the distance from X to AT. So that's actually, okay, what I should, this is actually not deadly, whatever, it's, yeah. This is generic chaining, right? This is, this is correct, that's correct. This is, this is the generic chaining upper bound. No, no, this is just the upper bound. It's the easy direction. This is the generic chaining upper bound. Yeah. Yeah, this is but why is the quantifier like for all XTI in ATI and for all XT in AT? Because it always feel like if you're doing this kind of, kind of like, I don't know, sequential process, would yeah. it suffice if there just exists one pass that have this bound being small? Um, good. So well, recall that we need to show, we, we're trying to like bound the error for every point X in my space. So the natural thing to pick is for X, I pick the closest point in A0, the closest point in A1, et cetera. So it's technically not that I need to, yes, it's technically it's not true that I need to like for all X in AT, all, all uh, XT plus one and AT plus one, but it doesn't really matter because um, the, the size of AT is two to the two to the T, but the number of pairs I'm bounding over is like two to like the three times two to the T. And like this constant next one doesn't, I just don't care about it. And it just doesn't come in because I can just ramp up the constant of my like variance. So it, it just doesn't matter in the end, even though, yeah. That's kind of the reason to pick these sizes two to the two to the T. It's like the exact point at which um, the size of AT plus one and the size of AT are like comparable enough in this context that you just increase this constant. Yeah. That's the reason for this choice, exactly. <clears throat> Good. Um, okay, so this is, yeah, so this is what people call the generic chaining upper bound. Uh, as a couple notes, um, I guess I wanted to say two things at this point. You can ask, like, is this the best possible analysis that you can do? Like, did, did, maybe could I have done the analysis in like a smarter way and picked like the, you know, I don't know, like not, not pick the A's this way, like just done the analysis in like a completely different way. Um, there's a theorem of Tallegron called the major rising measures theorem, which is that basically for settings like this, where I have these like, basically when I have random variables and I have sub Gaussian tail bounds on things that are going on, that the way, like the best way to analyze the value of this process is exactly by picking these sets. Like it's it's basically saying that like, if I wanted to analyze some random sampling type thing that has some Gaussian tail bound, that this is the best you can do. That's called the generic chaining. Um, that's called the major rising measures theorem. Um, okay. Though I should mention that uh, the theorem doesn't really tell you, it like kind of tells you how to pick the AIs, but like not really. So there are settings where you can show a bound that in principle, there should exist sets A that imply it, that like have this bounded, but it's not that hard to find them. Um, and the thing I said earlier about the Dudley bound, so basically what the Dudley bound is, is that instead of bounding this expression, you bound this as at most sum two to the T over two, and then max over X and B. Like I move the max to the inside basically, of the distance from x to h. And this is called the Dudley bound. And in general, the Dudley bound can be worse than this bound. Um, and it can be worse by a, uh, it can be worse by basically a log n factor. Okay, yeah, that's the, but it can't be worse, but it can't be worse by any more than a log n factor. So for a lot of these like sparsification proofs, you kind of just ignore it because uh, getting the like tight construction where you say the log n factor here is challenging, <laughs> or at least more challenging.
Good. So I guess the final point to discuss is how do I construct the sets A and T of the desired size two to the two to the T that make this distance small? Because like this is exactly what I define my sparsification error to be. Okay. Now how to pick A and T such that that error is such that D X A T small, where recall the D distance between X and Y is the max over I in M of A I dot X minus Y absolute value over the square root of this sampling probability PI. Uh, so yeah, here is going to be basically what the theorem is. This is called more or less the dual pseudo call. Um, what it says, or like the setting, basically the setting I'm going to, the thing I'm going to prove is, um, let me define D tilde X, Y to be max over I in M of some B, I. So here you can think that B, I's are just the A, I's over square root P basically. So that's D tilde, okay. Then, uh, there, then uh, there exists a set A of size X of one over delta squared, such that the distance from X to A uh, for all X and B, so the distance from X to A is at most, uh, what would it be? I guess delta times max bi2 norm times v. Yeah. So this will tell us basically how to construct the AIs. I'm going to pick delta to be whatever makes the size of at to be two to the two to the t, and then this will give me my distance value. So that exactly plugs into there. Uh, by like proving this kind of a theorem would be sufficient to validate that quantity. Uh, maybe before I continue, let me try to interpret this theorem just a little bit. Um, so, yeah, wait, let me try to interpret this theorem just a little bit for uh, everyone's benefit. Um, what, what did you write for D tilde x, y? Uh, it's max i and m b i dot x. Uh, where does y? Oh, x minus y. Okay. Yeah, it should clearly be x minus y. Yeah. That, that's better. Yeah. Yeah, okay, that's much better. Uh, yeah. So, kind of, what is a different way you can interpret this theorem? Well, like this type of a bound. What it's saying is let b1 to bm kind of be arbitrary vectors, kind of arbitrary vectors, with some bound in their L2 norm. And now for every vector x in b, Consider like writing down all these terms, b1 dot x all the way to bm dot x. And then what this is kind of, what the theorem is kind of saying is how many different vectors, like how many different vectors can this m tuple take up to some additive error? And the answer is like that, that's the bound basically. Um, it's saying that up to this kind of additive error, that's the total number of different values it can take. That's basically what the bound is saying. Yeah. Did, did that comment make sense? Maybe not. Uh, so, well, wait. So, like, um, when x is in b, I can write down this vector, right? 
And then for some other y in v, you know, I can also write down the corresponding vector. And then the distance is exactly just like the L infinity norm of the difference. Let me call this like B of X and let me call this like B of Y. So it's exactly the L infinity norm of like B of X minus B of Y. So, so kind of what the theorem is telling you is how many different like signatures a vector can have under different inner products. And if the answer is like not actually that many, like even if M keeps going higher and higher, like it doesn't like this bound doesn't really increase that very much. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, let me now just actually do this proof. Um, yeah, let me do this proof. Uh, the idea behind this proof will be to basically try to pack a lot of, uh, let me just write out what I'm going to do. So let me define K to be the following set. It's going to be the set, um, it's going to be the set of X such that i dot x and most some epsilon which I'm going to pick later for all i. So basically k is going to be the set such that like x and y are close if their difference is in k. So k eventually k is such that the distance between x and y is in most what epsilon if and only if x minus y is in K, okay. And now the way you think about it is I have my ball B and I'm going to try to find a bunch of points here such that if I put K around each of them that all of these are disjoint basically. K, 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 I'm going to find, let, so now let X1, X capital T be a maximal set of points such that X I plus K are all disjoint. What you can show then is that the distance from X to some xi is going to be at most basically twice epsilon because otherwise I could have put a ball of radius k around x and touched nothing. Or else x plus k is also disjoint. So this is like a packing, packing covering duality argument. So the plan now is to understand what is the maximal number of um, disjoint bodies K that I can pack into B basically. Now, how do we bound this? This is basically going to, the, the basic strategy is going to be to define a measure mu on Rn, which is going to be a Gaussian measure. Uh, so mu is going to be, let me say mu is proportional to e to the minus x squared, uh, let me write e to the minus delta times x squared for now. Uh, my delta is bad. So it's e to the minus eta times x squared. And now I'm going to try to lower bound the measure of x i plus k is at least something. And because I have this measure lower bound, I know I can bound t by how many, like t is going to be basically one over this measure. Let me just do the proof and see. Thanks so much. So, uh, I have a question. Yes. Uh, in this setting, because like 
uh, score of PIS taken to be like the norm of AI. Yeah. It seems like P of XY is like bounded by a constant times the Euclidean distance. Uh, yeah, that's right, right? D is going to be bounded by a. Uh, you mean like, so which expression? Are you talking about this one? At the very top, when you have the AI over square. Yes, that's right, yeah. So um, would it suffice for this argument to just use the Euclidean covering number um, bounds? That is basically what this is, yeah. It's like, but, but you need to use this for like the more general P norm setting. So, um, so oh, sorry, which Euclidean covering bounds are you talking about? Just like the covering number of a ball. By a ball? By like balls of radius. Of no, no, ball. that's not sufficient actually. But why not? Um, okay. In this expression, I have, um, so when so covering balls by balls, like you just need exponentially many very quickly, right? Is the issue. Here I'm going here, like the number I need is much better than exponential basically all the time. It's like square of that. No, it's uh so like delta is going to start as being a constant basically. Delta is gonna be like um delta is gonna be initially like one and then like a half and then like a fourth, etc. So it's, it takes a while for it to get up to like exponential size. It takes like like log n steps for it to get up to exponential size. Okay, I see. Yeah, so it's like not sufficient to use the Euclidean argument. You actually need to use like it's this basically becomes um L2 by some kind of like L infinity is what it is really. I see. Yeah, so, you're using the fact that like M is M is finite. Yeah, I'm using the fact that M is finite. That's right. Yeah. Very strongly I'm using the fact that M is like, yeah, like this bound, it's root log M, right? So like when M is two to the N, then you get Euclidean by Euclidean. But then that makes sense because then I get delta times like some stuff that depends on N, which is sensible. Yeah. But here I'm using very strongly that M is finite. And I will see in the proof soon where it's going to use that M is finite very strongly. How big should we think M is right now? Uh, so M is the original. So M is just like the original number of terms in my sparsifier. So M is like the input size. So like think of like polynomial in N, something like that. If it was like two to the N, that would be. If M was two to the N, then I guess you get a root N here. That's right. Yeah. So yeah, if M is exponential, kind of what happens is this argument as written will reduce the sparsifier size from M to like N times log M, but then you can like repeat it again. <laughs> so like you can reduce it again. So like it somehow doesn't really matter in the end if you get log N or log M. Yeah. Okay, so remember the setting, we have the measure mu of X is proportional to e to the minus eta times x two norm squared. And we want to lower bound mu of xi plus k. This is done in two parts. In part one, we're going to just lower bound mu of k. Just basically when xi is zero. And in part two, we're going to try to compare Uh, mu of xi plus k to mu of k. Okay. The first part is going to be kind of just a union bound with Gaussian tail bounds. And part two is going to be some kind of like symmetry argument. Let me just do part two first for, uh, let's see. So in part two, the way to compare, so what is this saying? This is saying I have some, I have some Gaussian and I have some convex set k here. Symmetric convex set, in fact. And I want to understand what is the measure of this set compared to the measure of its shift to xi plus k. Okay. That's kind of what this is saying. Like, how badly can the measures differ? And to do this, we just do the following sequence of inequalities mu xi plus k divided by mu of k is the integral, the following ratio. It's integral of e to the minus x, xi plus x squared, x in k, 
divided by e to the minus eta x squared x and k, right? So if we keep going, let's focus on the numerator because the, the denominator doesn't have an xi. So in the numerator, remember that k is actually a symmetric set. So we can write this as is e to the minus eta xi minus x squared plus e to the minus eta xi plus x squared, right? Uh, by using symmetry on x. And you can check that this is e to the minus eta x i squared minus eta x squared by using convexity. So this is e to the minus eta x i squared. Uh, I left out the integral. I'm going to add it back in. e to the minus eta x squared. This is just the numerator. That term will cancel with the denominator. I know that e to the minus eta x i squared, which is at least e to the minus eta, because we assume that x i two norm was at most one. Um, so the difference in their Gaussian mass is going to be e to the minus eta by using a symmetry argument. Okay. That's a half. Uh, good. Uh, probably you need a one half here. And then, then, then that inequality is actually true. You need to want to have there. And that inequality is actually true. Okay, so now let's go back to part one, bounding mu k being at least something. Okay. So for this, let me let m be the max of uh, bi two norm, right? And recall what k was. K was the body where bi dot x was at most epsilon for all x. And epsilon is going to be that quantity over there. Um, so basically, by a Gaussian tailbound, x is from that Gaussian. What is the mass of k? Well, well, what is the probability that x is drawn from e to the minus e to the x squared that b i dot x is greater than epsilon? It's basically going to be. Eta um, okay. over m squared and then times this wrong. I believe it's this eta epsilon squared over capital M squared by a Gaussian tailbound. So now, by a union bound, the mass of k is at least 1 minus m times this quantity. Right? So, I, my, so my goal is basically going to be to have it be at least 1 half by setting epsilon and eta. Uh, by setting epsilon and eta. Okay, uh, and finally, I think what you do is, uh, I'm not gonna write all this out because it's getting a little bit much, but uh, you set, basically you set epsilon to be this quantity that I wrote here. And then you can check that you need to set eta to be basically one over delta squared to make it work out. Then it'll be fine. Okay. Um, Okay, I think I'm basically almost done. So let me just try to just uh, wrap this up um, now. Okay, 
So now the plan is basically going to be to take this bound I just showed here and plug it back into this. Uh, I'll try not to do it too formally because it's going to be a bit but So remember that I got the size of A was X of one over delta squared. So I'm going to set delta to be two to the minus T over two. So then this will this gives me exactly a t has size two to the two to the t. And the distance from x to a t will be at most delta root log m times the max over all i of basically the norm of a i over root p i. Uh, because that's the definition of my distance up there. And uh, by the norm of PI, uh, and by our choice, PI was AI squared times rho. This quantity is one over square root of rho, right? So plugging this all in, and uh, delta remember is two minus two over two. So plug it into here, you get sum two to the t over two times two to the minus t over two delta root log m times one over square root rho. Okay. Uh, one over root rho square root log m sum over all t at least zero. Um, this looks a little bit scary because I'm summing a constant over like all t, so that's not great. Uh, once again, uh, this is the part where things get a little technical, but basically you can show that you can truncate at t as long m, basically. And the reason you can truncate at t equals log m is uh, because, recall that the size of a t was 2 to the 2 to the t, which is going to be bigger than exponential, like for t bigger than log m. Like basically I'm going to have such a fine net as when like t is log m that I'm covering everything super well. Like I have way more than exponentially many points so I can truncate at log m. And then to just finish, this gives me one over root rho times log m to the three halves. And rho at the very beginning was how much I oversampled by. So you set a rho to be one over epsilon squared log m cubed. Uh, and this final quantity would be at most. And that's the error bound. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. So that's like a high level, just like this is just like I tried to hit on all the main steps for how you would analyze such a thing. But I, it's, it's a little hard to get into all the details. Okay. Um, so that's all I had like mathematically. Does anyone have any general questions about this proof? Um, if not, I might try to state a couple open directions before concluding. This type of proof generalizes to any norm? Um, this type of proof generalizes to any uh, norm. There is no argument. Good, okay, so sum of any norms. The main, the main question is how do you define the, the two questions are how do you define the sampling probabilities? And then how do you do this kind of like measure analysis? I guess the main idea there is to, um, so here all the measure analysis was done with the Gaussian, which was like E to the minus X squared. Somehow our idea was that seems natural because we're sparsifying sums of squares. So in the norm case, what we do is we instead use the measure E to the minus N of X to like, to get the sampling probabilities and do this analysis. So we like change the measure to some other log concave measure that behaves better with the norm. And then you can do similar types of analysis there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I guess I'm interested that uh, you said you needed M to be finite or sort of small. And yeah. like, does this statement sort of like not true if M is infinite? No, no, no. Uh, um, oh, which state? I guess which statement are we just are we talking? Uh, about? Just the, the the whole theorem. Oh, the whole theorem. The whole theorem does not need m any bounds on m. Okay. Uh, the reason the whole theorem doesn't need any bounds on m, at least one way you could think of it, is like imagine m is like 
uh, like imagine M is kind of large. Then I can reduce this. Basically, the analysis I've written is you can reduce M to like N times poly log M with some error, but then you can like just do it again. And you're not losing anything. anything yeah, yeah, yeah you, you don't lose much. Yeah, you can set up in a way where you actually lose nothing. Yeah. Okay. So you can reduce this. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. There's other ways to do the analysis. We like don't see the M even as much as this. Okay. Yeah. Uh, did you have yeah, I wanted to ask, like, how do you get rid of all the log factors? How do you get rid of all the log factors? Okay, uh, let me answer that in a couple. Of... So if you do like the more majorizing measures type thing, you can get down to a single log, which makes sense. Because, yeah, I guess you can get down to a single log. That's necessary for a sampling-based approach. So how you remove all the logs is not based on sampling, really. Um, the way the proof works of Batsman, Steelman, Subastava, um, basically the thing they do is, okay, so once again, we're in the, let's be in the setting where the sum of AI, AI transpose is the identity matrix. What they do is they set up the following type of barrier function, which is, we define it called phi is trace of, it's, I think, I think it's like, okay, let, let's let A be my current matrix. It's going to be like A minus lambda inverse, and then maybe plus trace of lambda bar I minus A inverse. It's like somehow they set up this barrier function. And the goal of this barrier is to guarantee that A is at least a lambda and most lambda bar, okay? And then they show that there exists a vector AI that you can add to my current, like I'm gonna build this far as far by adding like a rank one update time by step, step by step. So they show that there exists a rank one update that I can do to A that keeps the potential bounded, even if you increase lambda and lambda bar by a little bit. Did that make sense? Like the general strategy is initially I have A between lambda and lambda bar, and in one step, I'm going to increase these to like lambda plus eta and lambda bar plus eta bar. And A is going to increase to like A, A plus W, I, A, I, A, I transpose. And I'm going to show that for these new choices that the potential is still bounded, that there exists a choice of A and W that makes this true. And to show this, well, it's a rank one update, so I just expand all these things with Sherman Morris and then just check that it works. Yeah. Did I answer the question somewhat? Yeah, but but that's how the proof works. It's very, it's very, very different. And I don't know how to make this proof work at all for any other P P P power. So that's like a good open question. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, maybe I'll just like verbally state a couple of open questions. I guess one thing is since we're already on this point, um, as I said, for L2 sparks, you can get N over epsilon squared. Can you show that bound for kind of any other problem? <laughs> like, I don't even, yeah, there's a couple of natural candidates, like P power is natural. Um, another one is like maybe hypergraphs where all the hyperedges are size three, maybe. <laughs> like, that seems like a natural one where maybe something can work. That's one. Another, okay, that's one open problem. Another open problem is that. A lot of these proofs where I have this like sum of ai dot x squared, I can analyze the proof with the matrix turn off. And in fact, you can sparsify things like, you know, norm of ai time, x, but now a is a matrix and not a vector. You can also sparsify that. Basically, that's going to follow from some matrix turn off type bound. Um, but then you can ask, can I give a proof of that that looks, that uses chaining methods and not matrix turn off? Um, and that would be interesting. Like, can you construct these chaining sets AI that show that bound? In principle, the majorizing measures theorem tells you that such AI exists, but can you give something more explicit? Okay. Uh, and maybe one reason that's interesting is because there's, once again, I don't know too much about this, so I'm a little, being a little speculative. Uh, there's questions about like whether you can show turnoff bounds for sums of sums of, uh, plus minus tensors. And my understanding is this is somehow related to like some kind of existence of LDCs, like locally decodable codes. But I, once again, I don't know anything. Maybe Zeph knows more. No, okay. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, so that's another thing. Okay, I think that's all I had. Thanks.
More questions? Can you make this uh, deterministic? It's probably not. But... Uh, this algorithm is deterministic. Oh, it is. It's like polynomial time deterministic, but that's the only one that I, for other p-th powers, I have no idea. Yeah. For the other ones, can you at least check if you got the right answer? No, okay. Uh, okay, good. That's a good question. Um, I believe you, it's, it should not be hard to show that checking whether two graphs are cut sparsifier should be NP-hard. I, I feel pretty confident in that statement. Or like maybe and maybe hard under small settings, so just like something like that, but it should be hard. Yeah. That theorem you show over Rn, we can construct such A sets, but what about over other domains? Is there uh, any similar things? I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I don't know what other domains. I haven't really thought about other domains. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks again. Yeah.